546 in your hymnals. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. There are not a lot of high notes, so I will let you sit. Christians' privilege to vote and pray. The privilege to vote and seek God as an informed Bible-believing Christian while not being influenced by secular, non-believing platforms. So for all those in the USA, how are you going to vote next month in the presidential election? Well, next month is not too far away, by the way. All right. Will you vote Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green, Independent, or question. I've read a number of articles on whether Christians should vote, how Christians should vote, and so on. There are many differing ideas. I come from a country, Australia, where voting is compulsory. Australia doesn't have the type of constitutional protection America has where there is a special emphasis on free speech, freedom of religion, and free exercise of religion as written in the First Amendment. I do praise the Lord for the freedoms that have been enjoyed in this great country. When my wife and I became naturalized citizens many years ago, we were thrilled to know we could then choose to vote and contribute to who would be elected to shape what happens for those living in this nation. We do take voting very seriously. So this month, 
right before what many are saying will be the most crucial election in America's history, I thought it would be good to share with you the principles we use in regard to this important matter. God's Word tells us that as Christians we are to be salt and light in the culture, Matthew 5, 13-16. To us, part of being salt and light is our neighbors seeing us participate in how the nation is governed and to apply our Christian worldview in deciding who we vote for. It's important to be reminded of the warning Jesus gave to the disciples when he said, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, Matthew 15, 18 through 20. In Luke we read Jesus stating, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks, Luke 6.45. Jesus taught us if you want to know if a tree is good or bad, we can look at its fruit to see whether it produces good or bad fruit. He was teaching us that we can look at people to see what kind of fruit they have by judging what they say or do. Now consider what some people were saying recently about presidential candidate Joe Biden choosing who would run for vice president with him. It is very important to have a woman of color or a woman, as Biden has said, on the ticket, CBS News. If he wants us to not just vote but bring our family and communities along in record numbers, he's got to put a woman of color on the ticket, USA Today. He better pick a black woman, Politico. In other words, to these people quoted above, what is most important is how someone looks on the outside. Now that is not the correct way to decide who to vote for at all. Think about what God taught us when Samuel came to anoint the king. He didn't know it was going to be David as we read in 1 Samuel 16, 6 7. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Samuel thought it would be David's brother he would anoint king, but God taught Samuel it's not the outside that matters, but the inside, what's in a person's heart. For a Christian, the outside, such as the shape of someone's skin, the shape of their eyes, how handsome or attractive they might be, is not important. It's who they are as a person, what they believe, and how they act. In other words, their fruit that's important. After I gave a talk at a church on the fact all humans belong to one race and explained that there really are no truly black or white people as we all are basically just shades of the brown pigment and melanin, a dark-skinned person came up to me on stage. He said to me, so there are not truly black or white people, we're just all shades of brown? I replied, that, is, uh, that this is what I had taught. Then he said to me, well, I voted for Obama because he was black, and now you're telling me that that was a stupid reason to vote for someone because he's not black anyway. I said to him that we shouldn't vote for someone just because they're shade of skin. We need to vote for them because of who they are according to their heart. He certainly got the point. We also need to understand the role of government. First of all, it's important to recognize that God has ordained government. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God, Romans 13, 1. And the purpose of government is to maintain law and order. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God and avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Romans 13, 3 to 4. So obviously, I want to vote for those who will want to maintain law and order. Of course, I also understand that if someone doesn't believe in the Bible as the absolute authority, then right or wrong, or good or bad becomes totally subjective. However, I know many people hold inconsistently 
to the morality that comes out of Judeo-Christian ethic, even if they are not necessarily Christians. That's no guarantee they will continue to do this, but it's still an important issue. Romans 13, 1 above also makes it clear that those who do govern are instituted by God. God is in total control. Remember, in Daniel 2.21 we read, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Okay, now this then brings up this issue of man's responsibility and God's sovereignty that some see as a dichotomy. What is the use of voting if God determines who is elected? On the other hand, if our voting determines who is elected, then how can God be sovereign over this? Well, all the way through Scripture, we see man's responsibility and God's sovereignty working hand in hand. We see this in salvation where we are told, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, Ephesians 2.8. And yet, we're also told that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10, 9. There are numerous examples throughout Scripture where we see both human responsibility and God's sovereignty. To me, it's simple. God is infinite, and we are finite. So the infinite, all-knowing God, brings these two things together in a way I can never understand. But I need to be faithful in obeying God and do what He tells me to do. So yes, we all should vote. That's our responsibility. And understand that at the same time, God is totally in charge of who is voted in. But also remember, there may come a time in this fallen world because of the sinful actions of people when we have to be like Peter and the apostles and say this. We must obey God rather than men, Acts 5.29. Now we also need to look at the moral issues confronting us in the culture and judge what people are doing against the absolute authority of the Word of God. But judge with right judgment, John 7.24. We see major issues prevalent in the culture today concerning marriage, abortion, and gender. Based on God's Word in Genesis, marriage, there is only one true marriage, the one God created in uh, Genesis 2.24. One man and one woman. Abortion. Humans, not animals, are made in God's image. Genesis 1.27. We are totally human right from fertilization. Therefore, abortion is murder. Gender. God made only two types of humans, a male and female. Genesis 1.27. What about other issues like climate change? Well, Noah's flood caused dramatic climate change and climate change ever since. If people don't believe the history from the Bible concerning the flood and its consequences, they will make wrong decisions regarding climate change. Also, Genesis 8.22 tells us that while the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So when political candidates tell us that people will destroy the earth in five or ten years, we know they are wrong. Now that's not to say we shouldn't care for the earth for God's glory and use it for man's good, but that's a whole other topic. However, here comes the difficult part. We live in a fallen world. Most of those running for a political office are not born-again Christians who have a truly Christian worldview. For me, I also consider for some positions whether someone even has a likelihood of succeeding, part of my human responsibility. I'm sure most of you have heard someone say this, if you find the perfect church, don't join it as you'll spoil it. You won't find the perfect church you won't find the perfect candidate. I also know what a blessing it is to have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and free exercise of religion. So I also look for candidates who will defend this as I pray we will continue to have the freedom to preach God's word and the gospel as we do through Answers in Genesis, Ark Encounter, and the Creation Museum. 
millions of lives have been impacted by what God has called us to do, and I know there are atheists and other anti-Christians running for office who would like nothing better than to shut down such Christian witness. Okay, I feel rather exhausted having explained all that, so now I do my due diligence. I check out those who are up for election and who I will have to vote for. I judge their fruit against the above criteria, and then I vote accordingly. So my admonition to us all, don't vote as a Republican, Democrat, Independent, etc. But vote as a Bible-believing Christian who has taken his or her responsibility very seriously. And what else? Pray, pray, pray for the coming elections. Yes, pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Also pray for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And then he adds some things about praying for their particular ministry. Thanks for stopping by and thanks for praying. In addition to that, I'd like to show you a video. I've stated this before, that we should be voting not based on personalities. And really, uh, I agree with him on the issue of even being Republican or Democrat and that kind of thing. It's not in this election. It may identify where a person stands, but that's not what's really at stake. He stated this is the most critical election in our nation up to date, and it is. What we are seeing here is you are voting not merely for a person, but for a worldview, for a, a movement, uh, or an ideology. Um, 529 stay <laughs> by day. We'll sing just the first verse. chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll be looking at verses 6 through 8. Let's stand together as the Word of God is read. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Father, we look forward to the appearing of Jesus Christ. We look forward to what comes after this life and service for you. I pray that you would direct us in your word this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The Apostle Paul, he said, uh, I'm being poured out as a drink offering already. He realized that as he was in the Roman dungeon, very soon he would lose his life. And he was assured of that, so he says, I'm at the end of my journey in this life, 
And then he says, henceforth, and literally that means as for the rest, or as for what comes after. And he speaks about what is the as for the rest. What is the as for the rest? When a servant of God finishes his service in this life. What do you have to look forward to? What encourages you or what scares you? What doubts do you have? What hopes do you have? You should bear in mind what comes after gospel service in this life. And that will help to answer a lot of these questions that I pose this morning. And also the question of, is it worth it to really put my whole commitment and loyalty in being a servant of the gospel of Jesus Christ? What, what comes afterwards as for the rest? And you need to bear in mind what comes after gospel service in this life. And there are a couple of really good reasons we see in verse 8 in answer to this question. And I want you to see, first of all, that the Apostle Paul says the Lord Jesus will reward his servants. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me. Now, the one that will give this reward is the Lord Jesus himself. Now, the crown they uh, talk about in the Greek is the stephanos. It's not the crown of a king of uh, sitting royalty, but it was like the wreath that was given to a competitor in one of the games as he finished and won the prize. They would give him a wreath of recognition for his accomplishments and his efforts. Now, in those games, only one could be the winner. It's a lot like our sports today. You got first place, then everything else is... Uh, I've seen a t-shirt, second place is first loser or something like that. I don't know, but uh, it's all about being first place. In Christian service, there is a reward for everyone who is faithfully in, uh, involved in serving the Lord. And he says, I will get that reward. Now, I've heard people say we shouldn't be out for rewards in serving the Lord. Now, if we're in it just for our own glory and and to uh, get our own recognition that is true, that is a very selfish thought, and it is not a right motive for serving the Lord. But I am looking for reward from the Savior because if He rewards me, that is His way of saying, I am pleased with you and what you have done. And that brings glory to the Lord. Notice He will praise, or in other words, commend, honor, congratulate, celebrate them, for their works of righteousness. There are several passages of scripture I'd like to take you to this morning that go along with this thought that support this thought, 2 Corinthians, to begin with in chapter 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad or useless. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 11 through 15, he, he goes on to talk about this same kind of concept. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare, because it shall be revealed by fire or judgment, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he had built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself <coughs> shall be saved, yet so is by fire, by judgment. So there will be rewards for those things that please the Lord, that are within His will and His purposes. You'll suffer the loss of that reward, 
if you don't serve the Lord faithfully. In Philippians, in uh, chapter th uh, 3, verses 13 and 14, it says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus or of the upward call. There is a prize, the apostle says, I'm striving for. And in 1 Corinthians Chapter 9 and verse 24, again we see this concept. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. You see this crown that is given can be seen in two ways. And the, and the first way we see here is it is a reward for service rendered. The second way we'll look at in just a moment. And we really don't know which is the best way to interpret this. Perhaps there is a sense in both. Uh, both ways are involved in this, but... Uh, in this sense, it's a lot like a, an award ceremony after athletic contests. You know, you get involved in these contests and afterwards they call everybody together and say, okay, we're going to hand out ribbons or uh, recognize and put on the platform on top the first place, the second place, the third place, and we're going to award those who have accomplished the goal. The second... Uh, Before I, I get to the second one, I just want to say this. If we do get this type of crown, it is something that we will use to glorify God with, and not only once, but throughout eternity. If you go with me for a, a few moments to Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4, and we'll be looking at verses 9 through 11. John sees into the future as God uh, shows him things that will happen in heaven and uh, in the end times. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. And uh, a good deal of Bible scholars believe these 420 elders represent the believers, the Christians. And worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Notice, when the beasts give glory is not one time, but this continues, and they fall down, and they put the crowns, they cast the crowns, they thrust the crowns at the feet of Jesus to indicate He is the one worthy of all the praise, because we are only able to serve, we're only able to accomplish the things that are accomplished by the grace of God as He works in and through our lives. And he is the one that deserves all the glory for it. And the thought is, every time that they come before him, they cast the crown. So any crown that you win throughout the rest of eternity, over and over again, you will give glory to the Lord Jesus for it. The second way to take it is that the crown is actually righteousness itself. And if that's the way you take it, it's saying that he will crown you with righteousness. Now, there are some support passages that some people use to think that this might be the way to take it. For instance, James 1.12 and Revelation 2.10 talk about it as the crown of life. 
It is not a crown of life that they already had. It is a crown of life that God gives them, forever life, eternal life, uh, never-ending life. And so it's, life itself is the crown, and if righteousness itself is the crown that the Apostle Paul is talking here, he's saying he will present them with his perfect righteousness. One way or another, that is still true. If that's the way to take this passage in interpretation, we're not totally sure, but it is still true according to the Scriptures. Let me take you to these passages yeah, in Philippians 3, 20 through 21, it says this, For our conversation, our conduct, our way of life is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. These corrupt, sinful bodies, these vile bodies are going to be changed into bodies that are fit for heaven and celestial. I'm looking forward to that time. Uh, I hope that you are too. 1 John 3, 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. That doesn't mean we're going to be deity. We're not going to be essentially in nature God. But we will have the same character. We will have the same uh, uh, incorruptibility. We will have the same immortality. And we will have the same righteousness as he has. We'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. This righteousness is sanctification, even as he is pure. We're already in the process of being purified. We'll be totally purified, totally sanctified, totally righteous when we're, we're in the presence of the Savior. I can hardly wait for the day when I'm in the presence of Jesus, totally sinless. No more battles with temptation. No more failures of the one for the one who died for me and saved my soul from sin. I can hardly wait. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 through 54. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption, that which decays, inherit that which is incorruption, that's does not decay. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That which dies will never more die. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. The Lord Jesus will reward his servants with total righteousness. Live for Jesus, well done. His approval for His glory. Strive for rewards that you can have to glorify Jesus with throughout eternity. Secondly, in verse 8, it makes it very clear here in Timothy that this will happen at that day. And that day that he's referring to is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ.
constantly throughout the scriptures are looking for the return of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus will return for his servants. Now, he's looking forward to that time because he will be rewarded. And he says, it's not only for me, but for all them also that love his appearing. The question is, are you one of those that love his appearing? Only the saved can truly appreciate Jesus' return. An individual who hasn't been saved from their sin cannot truly appreciate Jesus' return. You see, the saved understand this that we see in Romans 3, 23 through 25, that Jesus has pardoned the saved from their sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that's an expiatory sacrifice, or a sacrifice that satisfies all the righteous demands of God to take care of His wrath for sin, or in other words, an atonement for sin. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. So that propitiation is available for everyone as we're going to see in 1 John Chapter 2 and verse 2 is a potential, but it's only applicable to those who place their faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And as I said, 1 John 2, 2 talks about this. And he is the propitiation, the atonement for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He's died for the entire world. His death is the atonement for all sins, but it only applies to you when you put your faith in his blood. Only the saved can say Jesus has pardoned them from their sins in application. He's done it in potential for everyone, but only in application for those who have placed their faith in Christ and His shed blood. And Jesus has provided the saved eternal life. He's still there in 1 John chapter 5. And I like to go here with a lot of people in verses 11 through 13. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. And Jesus has promised to save the heavenly home. John 14, 1 through 3, we're so familiar with this passage. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, Believe also on me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Only the saved truly appreciate Jesus' return. And only the faithful will totally anticipate Jesus' return. You may be saved, others may be saved, but only the faithful among the saved will fully anticipate Jesus coming back. 1 John chapter 2 again and verse 28 says this, and now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Let me tell you something, that there are too many Christians who are so caught up in this world, or so compromised with the world, and so wrapped up in themselves, that they aren't and they won't be all that anxious for Jesus to return. 
I've heard it too many times of Christians that don't want Jesus to come back yet because they want to get married or they want to do this, they want to go here, do that, they want to uh, become a millionaire or, or whatever the case may be. They are not anxious. They are not loving Jesus' return at all because they're so hooked up with the world and so involved with the world and in themselves that when Jesus comes, they're going to be shocked and ashamed to be quite frank. I know a man who at one time was even a deacon in a Baptist church who stopped living for the Lord Jesus, got involved with the worldly crowd. Some of them were his relatives and some were his friends. His family got involved in the same way. And he didn't say this to me, but it was reported back to me what he shared. He says, I'm so glad that I don't have to be so strict and uh, follow all those kinds of rules that I'm, I'm free to do. Basically, he was saying, I'm, I'm free to be uh, sinning and not to be separated from sinners around me. He was not at all anticipating the Lord's return. And there are quite a few Christians that have the same kind of attitude, even if they don't say it. I'm so free to live however I want, however the world is going, I'll go with them and have a good time with the world. But I tell you what, when Jesus comes, they're not going to be so confident. Untangle yourself from the world itself. And serve Jesus Christ and the gospel service wholeheartedly and faithfully. So you won't be ashamed at Jesus' return. Let me close this way. With a challenge. Not in your own power and wisdom, but by the grace of God to get fully committed to gospel service, always bearing in mind what happens after your service in this life is through. Fighting a good fight, finishing your gospel course, and keeping the faith is and forever will be rewarding totally worth it all. Are you saved? If Jesus were to appear right now, would he take you into his presence for the rest of eternity? What's been done about your sin problem? Well, Jesus died for your sins. He paid the penalty. Have you put your faith in him? to be your Savior, so that applies to you. Do you have it? Would you do that today? Call on it. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus, save me. I'm putting my trust in you completely. You're the one who died for my sins. The only one that could pay for my sins. You're the only one that can give me eternal life. I'm trusting you now. You're a Christian. Be honest with yourself. How entangled are you with the world? How full of yourself are you? If Jesus appeared right now, would you be ashamed? Or would you be confident in fighting the good fight? I've been finishing my course. And 
I have been keeping the faith. Shall we pray? Father, help us to be ready for what's after this life. May we say with the Apostle Paul, as for the rest, there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me. And may it be something that we can use to bring you glory throughout the rest of eternity. If there's a soul that needs saved today, I pray that you save them from their sins. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, we'll sing this final song. If you need help, Spiritually, the decision to make, to be saved, get right with the Lord, come. As we sing by coming, say, I, I need someone to help give me guidance, to pray with me, to be with me, walk through this with me. We'll love to do that with you. Our final song is 611, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Let's stand as we sing. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee. Filled with messages from Thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a my good I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Every power as thou shalt choose. Here's the key to it all our will. Our choice and our desire will govern a lot of the rest of this. And so as you sing this verse, sing it very seriously, mean it, take my will. Take my will and make it thine shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be my royal throne. Take my love, my God, I Treasure store, take myself.